Um, I'm going to talk to you about compromise. Uh, and I, I apologize in advance if you saw the docket for this and you were like, ooh, someone from Facebook is coming to speak. They're going to talk about cool Facebook things. They're going to talk about live and reactions and this, these, all these incredible process for these like sexy things. That is not the case at all. I'm really sorry. Um, you're going to have to listen to me talk about this instead. There are some Facebook examples in here, but I mostly pick on other companies, actually. Um, if you want to pick on Facebook, you can come to me afterwards and pick on Facebook about stuff. I can't do anything for you, uh, but you can just vent your frustration at me. Uh, so, compromise. This is actually, this is a topic that's been like weirdly close to my heart uh, ever since I started at Facebook, because Facebook is an interesting example of, of compromise. Uh, and I'm going to do this in sort of a three stages, and they're going to be really fast stages because they told me right before this that I have like 15 minutes to talk and I kind of clocked it at like 25, uh, so we're going to just move. Um, I, I'm kind of going to do this in like three phases. Oh good, the clicker works. So hi, I'm Jonathan Smiley. Uh, that's my actual last name. I used to have at Smiley on Twitter, but I, I gave it away and I kind of wish, now I kind of wish that I hadn't because now it feels weird. Um, I've been at Facebook for about a year and four months, so not all that long. Um, although, fun fact, I've been there longer than almost half the company at this point, which is, you can read into that what you'd like. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to run through like sort of the free, three phases of how I have thought about compromise as a designer over the course of my career, uh, which is mildly longer than it looks like. I, I look fairly young. All, all of my age is on the inside. Um, so I'm going to start uh, at the beginning for me. Um, which I think this is a really entertaining quote about compromise. It's, we'll come back to it. Um, compromise is the refuge of the inept and weak-minded. This is roughly how I felt about compromise when I got started as a designer. And I, I think it's the way, whether we admit it or not, I think it's the way that sometimes we, we think about compromise. Um, part one of this is never, ever compromise. So, why would you never, ever compromise? Why never compromise? Why should designers never compromise? Why is compromise the, the last refuge of the inept and, and weak-minded? Uh, well, there's a lot of reasons. There's, there's this. There's, there's death by a thousand cuts. I, this is a phrase that I've used many times when I'm talking to people about design or when I'm talking about a particular design or when I'm in a meeting with a bunch of PMs and engineers and they're, they're kind of like coming at me with stuff and it's like, okay, guys, like death by a thousand cuts. Like we're going we're gonna to compromise this thing until it's dead. Uh, and that happens a lot. Uh, product, product guys will, you know, they want this and they want that and they want it for this reason and your design is wrong for this and that and engineers can do this and they can't do that and this thing is hard. Uh, and eventually you end up with like a, a Zune, right? You end up with like, I know, there's such an easy punching bag, I almost feel bad. Like it's been long enough. There's probably plenty of people who are like, what is a Zune? Um, which is the appropriate reaction. Uh, but you end up with something where it's like you could look at it, you could look at a Zune and you could be like, there were definitely some interesting things to it, but there were clearly, you can picture in your head the meetings where like a PM went, you know what, we have this technology that lets you share 30 seconds of a song if you're close to somebody, that needs to be in the product. Like, for no other reason. Nobody will use it and no one will like it, but it must be there. Um, and you, you do that like a couple hundred times and you end up with something that dies really, really quickly. Uh, I think the brand lasted longer than the actual product. Uh, so you, you might just, you know, compromise might lead you down this path where what you wanted to do gets, gets killed through, through all these like tiny, tiny little cuts and changes. Uh, you might hate compromise as a designer because you know better, and that is your job, right? Isn't that a designer's job? How many people in the, in the audience actually are designers, like would say that you are a designer? That's a pretty strong majority, I would say, and probably most people are like design adjacent or work with designers or something like that. Um, well, designers always, we always think that we know better, right? And part of our job is to know really well. It's to know the user really well. It's to know, you know, what the expectation is really well. Uh, it's to think deeply about a problem for a long period of time or, a, you know, a reasonable period of time so that you understand the nuance of it. Uh, and you end up in these situations where, and I've personally experienced this exact one, where the client that you're working with hires a new marketing director in week 11 of a 12-week project and this new person shows up and they have all these ideas and they have all these things that they want to do and they're really smart and you're just like, no, like, I know better than you. Come on. Like, we're not, we're not doing this. I'm not compromising with you. Like, this is, this is stupid. You know nothing. You might not want to compromise because you don't want to sabotage yourself. And I didn't mean to pick on Microsoft 100% of the time in the beginning of this talk, but I'm doing it anyways. Um, Steve Ballmer got up on stage, very famous, well, somewhat famously, once, when they were announcing the Surface tablet, the original Surface tablet, and his, his catchphrase was, no compromises. There are no compromises in this product. 
This is an uncompromising product. And what he meant by that was it just did everything. It did those Windows 8 Metro style apps. It also did conventional Windows things. It had this like weird dual UI, dual system thing going on. Uh, and it was just, it was rife with compromises. And it was pretty roundly savaged for that uh, when it was initially released. And it took them years to dig themselves out of that hole. Like it took them years to dig themselves out of this like incredible compromise where the basis of their design was an immediate compromise. It was some people want the new stuff and some people want the old stuff. Let's just give them both of the things. Uh, so they built this on compromise and it sabotaged the product for quite a while. Like I think it has only fairly recently been mostly considered to be a pretty strong product. Um, and for what it's worth, if there was Sketch for Windows, I would totally play with one of those big Surface workspace things. But there's not, so I don't. Um, and this is what really came down to me for a long time as a designer, when I was initially getting started, and for probably a kind of embarrassing number of years, frankly, uh, isn't design about being right. It, this was really drilled into me, especially when I worked at an agency, and I, I worked at an agency for quite a while, uh, which was clients hire you to be right. They hire you to do things that they can't do, and that they don't know, and they don't understand users all that well, and they don't understand UX all that well, or whatever catchphrase for UX we're using these days, UI, U something. Um, and design was really very much about being right. And this was how I felt for a long time. And this crippled me for years, like a, a, a shameful number of years. And I'm not going to divulge how many years that was. But it was enough, and I feel stupid about it. Uh, which was to just be really uncompromising and to really you know, fight for every inch and to be really intractable and, and other adjectives that are frustrating to people that are not you. And that led me to uh, sort of a second phase in being a designer which I think is, is somewhat illustrated by this, all principles can be compromised to serve a greater principle. So maybe compromise a little. This is kind of where I got to after, after a little while. Maybe, maybe compromise a little. Don't compromise all the time. Dig in my heels on certain things, but maybe compromise a little. And there's some good examples of this. So this guy, does anybody remember these? It's not that long ago. There's a few nods. There's a few like, nope, don't know what that is. Um, this was the pebble, which was, I'll let Deepa talk about this later. I don't, I don't know if she knows because I know she's relatively new to Kickstarter, but I think it was Kickstarter's most successful thing of all time or something, like the biggest Kickstarter of all time. Um, it was a huge deal on Kickstarter. And it was a smartwatch. It was, uh, it was a few years ago. It was like four or five years ago, something like that. Um, and when it was initially announced uh, on Kickstarter, it was Pebble Time, awesome smartwatch, no compromises. It's a really interesting, <laughs> I like you right in the front. You're very expressive and you're just like, hmm, I don't know about that, hmm. Um, no compromises. That is, a, that is a bold thing to say. It is also a complete lie, uh, which is okay, but it is a complete lie. This thing was built on a very, very specific compromise, which is that the screen was an e-ink screen, which is really cool technology, uh, because it doesn't take any power for it to hold its state. Uh, like, I, I wear a, we can talk about compromise later with this, um, but I have an Apple Watch, but like, if the screen is on, it's drawing power. E-ink displays are cool because if you can see the screen and it's not changing, it's not drawing any power, it just sits there doing nothing. Uh, but there's a compromise there, which is that the screen is really slow. It's really slow to update, it had a really weak processor in it. There were clear compromises made with this product that led to this like really, really slow display, but this crazy awesome battery, it lasted for like a week or something, or like over a week without charging, which like if I didn't charge this last night, it would be dead by now. Um, which is fine, because I'm a nerd and I carry charging cables with me everywhere. Um, but if I had left it at home, I would just be, it would just be a paperweight. Uh, so they predicated this on a really, really obvious compromise, which I think was really smart. Uh, it doesn't, it's, it's not this incredibly you know, vibrant display, and it doesn't do all these like, fancy bells and whistles, and it doesn't do these incredible animations, but how much do you really want those on a watch? Like, I don't know, not that much, not, not a whole lot. Um, so I think that was pretty good. And I've seen a recent example of this, and I'm gonna pick on the opposite of Microsoft for a little while, uh, which is I very recently got an Apple Pencil and an iPad Pro. Uh, which is super fun for doing like artsy kind of stuff or sketching or what have you. Um, the pencil is actually a really, really capable product. It's a really interesting product. It does like really clever things. It feels really good in your hand. It's, I could sing its praises for like a little while. It has one really glaring compromise, which is that when you go to charge it, you look like an 
idiot, like a complete idiot. Um, it sticks out of the iPad like this. It is the, just the most ridiculous thing. Like, are you kidding me? Uh, and it charges pretty fast. You don't have to do it that much. But I have literally walked around Facebook headquarters with my iPad with the pencil dead, so I had to charge it. So I'm walking around, and I should have just brought it up with me. I'm walking around with this freaking pencil sticking out like a flagpole. And it's just, you feel super stupid. Um, but this was a really clear compromise that Apple made for the pencil, which was we want it to be sleek, we need it to be chargeable, we want it to plug directly into the iPad to charge because the iPad Pro is huge and has a giant battery and it can charge it really fast, and that means that it has to have a little thing stick out of it. It has to have a little, essentially the end of your iPhone charging cable has to stick out of the back of this thing. Uh, and in order to do that, we need to have it stick out of the end and put a little cap on it. And don't even get me started on the little cap, which is this tiny little plastic piece, and when you take it off, if you drop it, it's like a 10-minute scavenger hunt, uh, and it's really frustrating. But when it's working and it's all put together and you're not charging it, it looks great and it feels really good and it works really well. Like this was a compromise that you could argue whether it was like the best compromise or not, but oh, and if you want to charge it with a cable like a normal human being, it comes with a dongle because <laughs> Apple loves dongles. Um, so that one's like questionable. And Apple has done this any number of times in recent years. And you could argue that they are maybe in a state of heightened compromise. Uh, as far as design is concerned, uh, because you get hilarious travesties like this, which is when you go to charge one of their, one of their mice, you can't use it because the charger is on the bottom. Um, so you plug it in and it just kind of sits there on its side like it's dead, um, and it's just kind of preposterous. And then there's the new MacBooks that have to have dongles for dongles and cords that go into dongles that go into cords that go into dongles. Um, and then there was this really unfortunate little victim of compromise. Uh, which, uh, fun fact about the Mac Pro, there's these apps now, I thought that this is a total tangent, but I thought it was really entertaining. There's these apps that uh, you can point them at stuff and they will describe what it is if you're like visually impaired or you know, visually disabled, they'll, they'll read it out. Um, and they're very clever and they're very smart and if you point them at a Mac Pro, they reliably say trash can. Um, so I don't, I don't think that very many people would argue that Apple is not a company that, that puts a high premium on design. I think that they do and I think certainly if you ask Johnny Ive, they do. Um, and they clearly make large compromises. Like all of these products are, are fairly significantly compromised. And there's other products of theirs that I really enjoy that are also quite compromised. The, the little AirPods, the little, the little headphones, I actually really love those. They're really, they're really great. You look like a complete tool while you're wearing them, which is a compromise. Um, also, I found out yesterday if you drop one on an airplane, it's very hard to find. Um, so they definitely make a lot of compromises, but I think by and large they're pretty considered with their compromises, and I think they, they lead to fairly strong products that would otherwise be somewhat unavoidable, because being super uncompromising about these things uh, would necessitate, I mean, you could probably figure out a way to do this pencil and not do it that way, and have it be cleverer, and have it be smarter, and have it, you know, not feel quite as janky when you go to charge it, and it would probably cost twice as much, or it would probably feel twice as heavy, or it would be off balance, or something would be wrong about it you end up having to make these compromises. And I think designers sort of hate to compromise in some ways. I know I did for a really long time, and that's kind of why I'm doing this talk. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, but I think the, the biggest one for me and the reason why, even as I started to get more acclimated to the idea that like, okay, I should probably compromise on some things, uh, whenever you compromise, it just feels like you're not smart enough. Or it feels like you're like, you did it wrong. Like you didn't quite, you didn't figure it out in enough detail. You didn't, uh, you didn't have all the answers, right? And the good news is that you don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers, you don't have all the answers, nobody has all the answers. Uh, so I think that's actually okay. And that is what has led me to, I think I'm moving fairly quickly here, which is, which is good. Because um, I didn't used to get to part three quite so fast. Uh, you don't have all the answers and that's okay. And that led me to, and I, I apologize for this next slide because it's way too much text to have on one slide, but I couldn't trim it down anymore. Um, and I like the quote anyways which is, if you're cast on a desert island with only a screwdriver, hatchet, and a chisel to make a boat with, go and make the best one you can. It would be better if you had a saw, but you don't. Uh, which I think is interesting in a couple of ways. It's interesting in a very pragmatic way, which is that you are not always gonna have a saw. Uh, and if you need to build a boat, you need to build a boat. Like, what are you gonna do? Uh, and I think it also just sort of speaks to the nature of you know, what you should do regardless of what you have. Even if you have a saw, like make the best boat you can with a saw. Like 
I'm not gonna lie, I couldn't make a boat with any of those tools. I couldn't make a boat with anything. Um, but maybe it's easier with a saw. But whatever I had, I wouldn't be able to make a very good boat. But if my job was to make a boat, I'll make a boat. And this is, this is kind of what led me to part three of this, which is to always compromise. Um, there's definitely a, a, a trick that I, it's not a trick, but this is maybe just a thing that I do when I speak about things, which is that I try to be like kind of hyperbolic about stuff because you always want people to like look back on your talk and be like, oh, what did they say? And it's like, oh, they said always compromise. Um, and then you, at the end, you carve out about 30 seconds for all the caveats where I'm like, I don't really mean that. No, 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 no. But in this case, I actually, I kind of do actually. I think, I think that it is important for designers to, to always compromise actually. Uh, and this is where I will give you an actual Facebook example uh, and it is probably the least sexy thing I could pick out from Facebook uh, of anything. Um, and that's because of Facebook for about, a, for about a year at Facebook, I worked on ads products. Everybody loves ads products. Everybody loves ads. Everybody loves Facebook ads, right? <laughs> yeah, everybody loves them. Um, everybody who laughed loves Facebook ads. Uh, Facebook advertisers are an interesting bunch. Uh, and working on ads is actually like a really interesting design problem. It's, it's, very, it's pretty challenging and it's pretty complicated. Uh, but Facebook advertisers, especially the really, the really high end, and ironically, BuzzFeed is included in that, and that's why I've been in this office before, was to talk to them about ads. Um, the, the, the highest spenders on Facebook, they spend actually a really, really significant amount of money. Um, I can't out Facebook, or BuzzFeed for this because I don't remember how much they spend, but it's a lot. Um, and they need particular tools, and one of those tools is called Business Home, uh, which is just as exciting as it sounds. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's, yeah, <laughs> uh, business home is good stuff. Um, this is something that I worked on for a little while. And this, working on this project is when I decided that the next time I spoke it should be about compromise. And it's because I had a really pivotal moment when I was in one meeting about this product. And I'm not gonna dive like way into what this product is because quite frankly, you don't care. Um, but suffice it to say that uh, really big advertisers on Facebook, they have lots and lots of pages, they have lots and lots of ad accounts, they spend a whole bunch of money. They need a sort of a bird's eye view of what's going on and you know how much money they're spending and where it's going and whether it's working and things like that. Uh, and I was in a meeting, and I was presenting this design, this actual design, uh, to my team, uh, to engineers and to PMs and what have you, uh, to, to get some feedback and to you know, outline specs and to talk about what we needed to build. Uh, and one of the engineers singled out a particular thing, which I'm pretty sure was this metric. I'm not 100% positive, but it was one of these metrics. I think it was this one, um, which was this thing that says total spend, which is essentially just like, how much money have you spent since the last time you were here? And this engineer said to me, yeah, we really can't do that. The math for that is too hard. Um, which, I know a few of you are like, wait, really? Like, it's just how much money you spent. It's actually like weirdly complicated. There's a lot of like time zone and currency change stuff and it's, it's all very strange. Um, but suffice it to say, this engineer said, yeah, this, this particular number, like, great idea, super valuable, we really can't do that. And as soon as this engineer said that, I sat there for a couple of seconds and then almost without thinking, uh, the next thing I said was, well, what could we show that would still be useful? Which <laughs> felt really weird to me. It felt really uncomfortable. As soon as I said it, like literally as the words were coming out of my mouth, I was like, oh God, why did I just say that? Like what kind of designer goes like, oh, well this is hard, so what could we do instead? Like please tell me, engineer. Like tell me how to do my job. Fill in these blanks for me. Um, I, I felt like kind of weirdly stupid and it was, it was really uncomfortable. Uh, and I think what had actually happened, and I, I've had plenty of time to go back and sort of analyze this because I, I literally stewed over this for like a week or something. Um, I, didn't, I didn't just clam up and not say anything, I think I said something. Um, I stewed over this for a little while and I think what had actually happened is that I had kind of internalized this idea of, no, I really needed to compromise. Like, this was not an instance where I needed to dig in my heels. In fact, it may be that there are no instances where I really just need to dig in my heels. Um, I needed to compromise on this particular point. The thing that I wanted to show was very valuable, and I still believe that it's very valuable, but it is not the only valuable thing. And there are other valuable things, and we found one, I'm fairly certain. I'm not on that team anymore, so quite frankly, I don't know what they do, and I don't care. Um, but I'm pretty sure we found something that was also valuable, maybe like 90% is valuable, and took like, you know, two days of work instead of like a six month re-architecture of like 20 data centers and like all of this nonsense, which obviously you wouldn't want to do. But my inclination when, when, you know, when this engineer said to me, 
well, we really can't do that was, as I thought back on it, I was like, shouldn't I have had like a better response? Shouldn't I have had like some sort of, sort of comeback where it's like, well, we really can't sacrifice you know, the good of the user on behalf of like, just this is hard for you. Um, and I think, we're, I, I think, I feel like a lot of us are probably guilty of at least thinking of that when an engineer says something like that, where it's like, oh, I'm so sorry, this is hard. Oh, your job is hard. Um, their job is hard. Uh, and some of that stuff is just, it's just not worth it. Um, so I really, really needed to compromise in this case, and like, really, how could I not? Like, when I thought about it, and this is what this is what Facebook has kind of done for me. Uh, other than you know, I can attach it to my name and I get to speak at things. Uh, just kidding. I, never mind. Um, Facebook has almost two billion monthly users. We're in almost every country, with some sort of obvious exceptions. Uh, we have, there's different devices, there's different speeds, there's different capabilities, there's different demographics, there's different amounts of time that they have in the day, there's different amounts that companies spend, like there's so many variables. And even with many, many, many products, and Facebook has quite a few products, uh, including some that apparently not everybody knows we own. I was in a cab yesterday and the cab driver spent a while telling me uh, how much he liked WhatsApp and he really liked it because it was not owned by Facebook. Uh, which by the way is not the case, we do own WhatsApp. Um, which was really entertaining and is maybe a good branding lesson, probably. Uh, but even with very, very many projects, you really can't make something that works for everyone. And this is something that I have tried to internalize a lot while I've been at Facebook, uh, which is just that you know all of this is very hard. It's very complicated, and you really can't you can't dig in your heels on anything. You can't refuse to compromise on stuff. Uh, and I, tr I tried to boil this down for myself, uh, and again with the usual caveat of your mileage may vary. Um, but these are the compromises that I'm gonna say you'll make, these are the compromises that I make, uh, but these are the compromises that you'll make. You will compromise on design, and I do this all the time. Uh, I've, I spent years actually working on design systems, design frameworks, uh, uh, template, you know, template sort of things and components. Um, it was not Bootstrap, it was the other one. We can talk about that later, it's a whole thing. Um, I worked on this for years, and Facebook has an extremely stringent design language, you might not know it, but we do, um, for especially like the core app and a lot of that stuff. We have a component library and things like that. Uh, and there are many, many times when I just have to break it and other designers just have to break it uh, and the design language just doesn't hold up and it doesn't do enough. Uh, and that's okay, like that's how design languages evolve and that's how you iterate and if you don't compromise on things like your design system or your framework, uh, you won't get anywhere. You'll be stuck exactly where you started. Uh, you'll compromise on technology. Uh, this was the conversation that I had, which was the number that I wanted was too hard. The number was too hard to get. You will have lots of numbers that are too hard to get. You'll have things that are just impossible to build. Um, you know, given given an infinite set of you know an infinite set of capabilities, I would I was almost going to say I would love if Facebook could just read your mind and do what you want. And then I realized if I stand up and say Facebook would like to read your mind, that's probably a TechCrunch headline tomorrow or something, and I'm going to get fired. Um, we don't really want that. But you know, when you think about like what's the optimal interface, it's like, well, I just want it to know exactly what you want and give it to you. Uh, but you can't always do that. You will compromise for business reasons. Uh, I always like to use the line, uh, designers fight for the user, uh, only because it's a reference to Tron and I'm a great big dork. Uh, but you are the person who's supposed to fight for the user. However, uh, you also have to fight for the business. Uh, none of this matters if your business goes out of business. You can't do anything for users if you don't make money. Uh, you will make compromises on what is best for your users in order to help the business succeed. Uh, and vice versa, you will make compromises for the business uh, to help users succeed. Uh, there are many teams actually at Facebook that do exactly this. There's lots of products that we have that are not monetized, they do not make money, they just burn it. Uh, but they're good for users, and you could argue eventually what's good for users is probably good for us. Um, so maybe it's not as philanthropic as I'd like to think, but you will make sacrifices and compromises for the business. This one sucks, but you will make political compromises. Uh, people are fickle and fallible, and you will work with people who are frustrating and want particular things and will not be moved, and sometimes you work for them, and you can't avoid it. Uh, no, one, no one is served if the impact that you could have had on hundreds or thousands or millions or billions of people is lost because you were unwilling to make this political compromise and got fired. Like, it's just, it's, it doesn't serve anybody. It doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for anybody else. Um, and there's plenty of work that you can do to alleviate that, but there's really no getting around it. And then the very last one, and then I will stop talking so you can listen to other people. Uh, this was the absolute hardest one for me, uh, which was that it, uh, you will have to compromise your ego. Uh, 
Uh, and I and many designers that I know, I, well, I won't speak for other designers, I have an ego the size of a planet, roughly. Uh, and I, th I don't think that I'm alone in that. I think that designers are interesting because we're one of very few professions who have the wherewithal and the technical skills to make documentaries about how great we are. Uh, looking at you, Envision. Um, so I think that we have pretty healthy egos and I think that that's mostly okay. Uh, I think that we live in sort of a weird gray area kind of world where a lot of what we have to fight for is you could look at it a lot of different ways, and if you don't have a pretty strong personality and a pretty strong ego, like you're, you're not really gonna be able to fight for a lot of that stuff. Um, but I, I have had to compromise on my ego so many times now, and I, I'm actually almost getting okay with it. I can sit in a meeting and I can admit that I did not know enough, and that I did not know the right information, that I did not produce the right design, that I did not factor in the business case correctly, I did not factor in the user's needs correctly. Um, I think that I have become a better designer as a result, I hope. You'll have to ask other people. I have a huge ego, so I think that I'm great. Um, but I, I think that that's true. And that was definitely the hardest one for me to, for me to get over. Uh, so I think that we as designers are design adjacent people. I just think that we need to always compromise. And I think a lot of, I'm gonna catch myself, and I did this even when I was practicing this to myself. I feel like so many talks that I see end with, this is what you do as a designer. And it's always some sort of like blanket statement. It's like, as a designer, you bleh. Uh, and I was just about to say, I think that your job as a designer is to figure out when you should compromise. And I do think that's true. I don't think it's the only thing you do, uh, but I do think it is a big part of what you should do, which is it, is, it is a large part of your job to learn when and how to compromise and to accept that most of the time you will be compromising, and I think that's totally okay. Maybe this was like super self-evident for everybody here and I am like the lone designer who, was imp who just did not figure this out for years and that's totally okay. I'm glad that I could take you all on this journey with me. Um, but that's, uh, that's everything I have to say. So thank you very much. Um, that's me. Uh, if you wanna talk to me in any venue except Twitter, I'm easy to find. So thank you, everybody. Oh, I need to keep these on. Oh, Jesus. So I, I have one just to kick things off. Uh, you Where are you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> uh, you mentioned having uh, ego as a designer, and I would say for every person I'm talking to, because they're confident in the work that they do, there's one person who's not at all confident in what they do. So I'm curious, what has built your confidence as a designer over the years? Well, I'm just great. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, this is actually something, uh, interestingly, this is something that comes up at Facebook design a lot, which is uh, imposter syndrome, which is uh, a pretty prevalent thing. I see a few like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. um, I, I actually have had that uh, a number of times as well, including not long after I started at Facebook, because there are a lot of talented designers there, and it turned out that I'm not the best one, which was tough uh, for me to deal with. Um, but we do talk about imposter syndrome a lot, and I think one of the things that uh, helped me build up confidence, uh, even knowing that I'm going to be wrong a decent amount of the time, uh, was just getting really comfortable with what my role was compared to the role of other people. Um, I think that it's very easy when you're in a room with uh, a lot of other people at a company, uh, PMs and engineers and executives in, in a lot of cases, uh, or marketers or what have you, uh, to look at them and they will they might also speak very confidently and to kind of feel like, oh my God, I'm like out of my depth. Like, can I really stand up for myself? Can I really, you know, can I really articulate myself? Uh, am I, is, it, is it correct that I should be in this room? Should someone else be here instead of me? Which is the, which is the root of imposter syndrome, which is that I am an imposter and someone else should be here instead. Um, and I think it was, it was just kind of realizing that uh, over time doing the work of a designer, whether you, whether you consciously do it or not, you do pick up a lot of, you pick up a lot of good instincts about what users want, how they're gonna react, how they're gonna behave, uh, what it is they're looking for. And I think internalizing that for me really helped uh, where I could look at other professions or even other designers and, and go, you know, you are very competent in your field, you are very knowledgeable about this subject, I am also competent in my field, I am also knowledgeable on related subjects and subjects that are valuable to bring to this conversation. Um, so I think, at least for me, it was, just, it was just getting very comfortable with what it is I'm actually bringing to the table and not trying to bring everything to the table, because that's also kind of a designer trap, which is that we, we get this idea in our head where it's like, I don't know if you saw this recently, there was a, a fake 
designer interview that was posted somewhere, which was this like designer talking about what design is. And right in the, at the beginning, he's like, you could actually argue that designers are the only real people at a company. Um, it was hilarious and super over the top. And it was really great. Um, but you, you definitely can fall into this trap where it's like, designers are everything, and designers should figure out the business strategy, and designers should figure out the user strategy, and designers should figure out how we're going to make money, and designers should figure out da 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 um, And it turns out that unless you're like a, a, a five-person shop, you don't actually have to do all of those things. Like, there are very talented people who can do those things and help you figure that stuff out. I think I'm rambling at this point. Cool. Uh, a lot. Um, well, we have the we have the probably enviable position of we have a very large testing population to pull from, um, which is that we have many, 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 many people, uh, and we have really good infrastructure to deliver uh, a different experience to lots and lots of different groups of people all at the same time. Um, so it's actually not particularly uncommon that your version of Facebook will look a little bit different than the version of Facebook of the person next to you. Um, we have teams of data scientists and researchers who set up these tests and monitor the outcomes. Uh, we do plenty of like moderated testing, like we do we do you know in-person lab sort of testing. Um, that's mostly to get early signal and, and confirm some stuff. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, what exactly I can or should say, knowing that this is recorded, and I think Facebook comms is going to look at it later. Uh, you could you could very easily argue that there is a way to look at that, which is that we use you all as guinea pigs, uh, which I don't necessarily feel great about sometimes, um, and it does lend itself to some really peculiar problems, like sentiment feedback that people are frustrated that they can't ask someone else how to use Facebook because their Facebook is different than than my Facebook. Um, but we do, we do a lot of that, and we examine the results very frequently and very quickly, uh, and tests go out and change very, very quickly. Cool.